Good afternoon. Uh, we're nearing towards the end of the day, but we're leaving some of the best sessions till the very end. This one is algorithmic trading made easy with MongoDB time series. And in this session, you'll be, among other things, learning how to build a simple al trading algorithm using two moving averages. Uh, the individual who's going to be taking you through all this spent most of his career in various technical roles across uh, the financial services sector, specifically in the trading and risk space, including commodities, equities, and securities financing. Um, some say that one of Nostradamus's prophecies predicted this man's birth, and that in his wallet, he has a photo of his wallet. I can't say if any of that is true or not, but what I do know is he's one of our most senior solutions architects. I give you Wojciech Witozinski. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the intro. I can confirm all these things are absolutely true. Um, so yeah, my name is Wojciech. I've been with Mongo for a year and a day, so it was actually my one year anniversary yesterday. Thank you. <laughs> And over this year, I've worked with Mongo, obviously, with all the different, different products which were part of the, the Atlas platform. And I really enjoy how much easier they make lives of developers. So I thought I could give it a shot and see how we, I could relate this to my previous life in electronic trading space. So today, we're going to look at building a simple algorithm. It's going to be very much use case focused. And the main idea is to show you how easy it is to build something, something very simple. All right, so agenda, very simple, straightforward. We're gonna discuss what time series actually is in the first place. Um, then we'll have a look at our use case in more detail, so a proper deep dive. And finally, we'll discuss some key takeaways and hopefully there'll be a few minutes towards the end for some Q&A. All right, time series. Um, what do we mean by time series? So there's a definition there I got from Wikipedia. So it's a series of data points indexed in time order. Good definition, I'm gon not gonna argue with Wikipedia. I'd probably simplify it even more and just say any data that's somehow linked to time is time series data. And, but is it really useful though? How would we use it in real life? Well, some of the examples are here. So if you think of IoT, more and more people drive connected cars. These cars constantly send tons and tons of data to servers with regards to location of the vehicle, speed, fuel consumptions, et cetera, et cetera. All of this is time series data. If we look at weather forecasting, well, weather forecasting is all about time series analysis, finding patterns and using these patterns to predict what the weather is gonna be like in the future. Similarly, in astronomy, we look at time series data related to location of things like uh, planets, um, satellites, whatever, and that allows us to project where, the, where that object is going to be in the future. And finally, um, financial services, obviously, a big use case. And um, yeah, we, it can be used for algorithmic trading. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So hopefully you see that algorithmic, sorry, that, sorry, that um, time series is a big topic and is widely used. What about algorithmic trading, though? Um, I'm guessing some of you maybe are from different industries, not necessarily financial services, so it's worth mentioning what algorithmic trading is. Well, it's just a program. Simple, right? <laughs> and just like any program, it just follows some instructions. But in this case, our end result is booking a trade, executing a trade, and hopefully making a profit, right? In terms of execution, we look at a number of different factors that we include in our magic formula. This is every company's secret sauce. They don't share it easily. So unfortunately, I can't g give you some real life examples here. And for today's use case, we're just going to use something that's publicly available, just a standard algorithm using two moving averages. What are the benefits of algorithmic trading? Well, trading has been done by humans for many, many years. And as we all know, humans make mistakes. Um, humans have a slower reaction time than software. And humans can base their um, actions on emotions. So all these things can negatively impact our PNL, which is not something we want to do. 
So to kind of exclude all these factors, we can switch to, we can switch to algorithmic trading. So that way we know we're gonna hit the best PNL we can. And why should we care? All of us here in the room, why should we care about algorithmic trading? Well, it's a big industry. Um, I pulled some numbers off the internet, so I didn't make any of these up. These are real, num real numbers. It's a big industry, and it's an industry that's only gonna get bigger. So there's some more data across different asset types. I'm not gonna go through those one by one. You can, you can read them if you want. Um, but yeah, it's a big business. More and more trading is done electronically and via algorithms. So if, if you guys work in financial services, you most likely use algorithmic trading already. If not, then you'll probably use it soon. And for those of you who maybe want to move to financial services, it definitely helps if you know what algorithmic trading is and maybe if you can build a simple scenario such as the one we're gonna look at today. So hopefully you now understand that algorithmic uh, trading is a big thing. All right, so we've covered, we've covered time series, we covered algorithmic trading. Let's finally look at our use case. So we're gonna use a simple moving average algorithm. So moving average is just an average of the last few data points, nothing super sophisticated. Our input is um, pricing data. Um, prices arrive every minute. In a real life scenario, you would probably have, you'd be connected to some kind of an exchange feed that would push data into your system or maybe whatever um, price provider or market data provider. In our case, for the, for the sake of this exercise, we, we have prices in a CSV file. We'll also have two variables. Um, because we're developers, we give them cryptic names, so we've got M and, and N. And these are used to calculate moving averages, right? So one of those will calculate the average from the last M minutes and the other one from the last N minutes. Again, simple stuff. Business logic, again, not and not too complicated, when one of the averages is greater than the other one we buy, when the opposite happens we sell, and so on and so forth. Those of you who like to visualize things, if you imagine a chart, we've got our price curve, and we also have two additional curves, these are our moving averages. Whenever they intersect the first time we buy, when they intersect again we sell, and so on and so forth. Our outcome in a real life scenario would be sending trade orders to an order management system or directly to an exchange. In our case, we're just gonna print, them, print out the trades on the screen and calculate the, um, calculate the individual and cumulative PNL just so we know if we're, how badly we're doing. All right, um, so we know what we wanna achieve. Now let's look at how we're gonna achieve it. So first we've got, our, as I mentioned, our CSV input, so it's a CSV file with prices and some other data that could potentially be sent by the exchange. We're gonna load that data into the database. Um, I don't think you'll be surprised to hear we're gonna use Mongo for this. Um, what we're also gonna use once we have the data in place in the database, we're gonna set up a materialized view which will have all the calculations. So Calculating moving averages will actually happen on the database side, and I'll, disc I'll go into this in more detail in a, in a few minutes. So that materialized view will hold our moving average values, which will then be used by a Java front-end. So Java front-end will, will book trades and show us what these trades were. Now there's one thing missing from this, uh, from this diagram, which is a scheduled trigger. Once we create our materialized view, we wanna make sure it stays up to date. So whenever a new price arrives, we want this materialized view to be refreshed. And, and luckily Mongo allows us to do that automatically. So again, brilliant stuff if you're a developer. So this is how we want to build our basic, Mongo, uh, basic uh, algorithmic trading simulator. All right, so the first part, we wanna load the data, very simple. In my case, I use the Python script to load data into Mongo, and we're gonna use a time series collection. Now, setting up a time series collection is actually very straightforward. It's the same command you prob you're probably aware of, create collection, but we just add some additional parameters to it. So we need to tell Mongo that, yeah, we're gonna store time series data there. So some of them, um, 
yeah, some of the parameters you see there are time fields. So that's, ex that's the field where we're gonna store the timestamp. We've got the meta field. So this is particularly useful if we get data from multiple different, let's say sensors in an IoT world or multiple different tickers in the finance world. So using that field, we can actually put data into the re relevant buckets. And granularity, in our case, we use minutes. And at the bottom of the screen, that's the line I used in my Python code. As you can see, short and sweet. Um, I skipped the meta field because I'm only, I only have data for a single instrument, so I don't have to bucket data into different bits. Um, so yeah, very simple way to do that. And once I create the collection, populate it with data, this is what I should see in Compass. So if you look closely, we've got a ticks collection now, and that collection is labeled as a time series collection. So this little time series label actually proves that we did the, we did the um, correct thing when we set it all up. So it's detected as a time series collection. And if we look at individual documents, we see that they each contain a timestamp, a price, and potentially some other data. But for the sake of this exercise, we only care about the price and the timestamp. All right, so we've moved data from a CSV file to MongoDB. Okay, so hopefully you all agree we're there. So we can take off these two items. Cool stuff. Now that we have raw data in place in Mongo, we need to process it. And for that, we're gonna use a materialized view. So there's some more code here, bless you. Um, so highlighted, so those of you familiar with the aggregation framework will recognize this. This is just an aggregation pipeline, right? And um, what's quite cool here is the bit highlighted in green. This is where all the magic happens. This is where we calculate our moving averages. So we create these two, two new fields. One is a simple moving average M, the other one simple moving average N. For each one of those, we just calculate the average of the price field from our specified window. So in the first case, it's the last three minutes. Second case is the last five minutes. So again, Mongo does it for us. No need to write code that will take all the different prices, sum them up, divide them, whatever. So it's all there out of the box. Now, the important bit here as well is towards the bottom, there is the merge stage. Now, what this allows us to do is store the results in a separate collection. So you'll actually have, this will generate a new collection with, with, the, with the results and that collection can be accessed by other apps. So, yeah. And so in this case, we're storing our results into a collection called averages. Now, I, in my simulator, um, I'm using a Java frontend and I wanted to be able to specify M and N values from the GUI. So I actually use Java to create, create my materialized view. So it does the exact same thing. Um, and if you see highlighted in green, we've got M and N which come from the, which come from the GUI and otherwise um, it does the exact same thing. So we're merging the results of our calculations into prices database and averages collection, right? Now once I execute this code, this is what I see in, in Compass. So I've got a new collection there which is called views and it has a single document only and that's the document with my materialized view definition. And what I also get is another collection called averages and this has the same data as we saw in our ticks um, collection, enriched with these additional fields with moving average values. So if you look closely again, you'll see that, yeah, we've got, the, we've got both moving averages there. So all these calculations happen behind the scenes. We didn't have to interfere with it at all. Okay, so we've created a materialized view. Um, it's got the calculations we need, so let's go back to our architecture diagram. Um, hopefully I agree with me that yeah, we've got this materialized view in place. Yeah, okay. So we can take this off, same with the calculations. So we are nearly there. Now, 
I mentioned before that um, once we create the materialized view, we also need a way to refresh, re uh, refresh it whenever a new price arrives. So to do that, we use scheduled triggers. So yeah, we're gonna automate the data processing part using Atlas scheduled triggers. Now, they're super easy to configure and manage. We schedule them similarly to a cron job. Now, I mentioned earlier, our prices arrive every minute, so I, I'm gonna create a trigger which um, gets executed every minute as well, and it's got some JavaScript code attached to it that refreshes these, uh, my materialized view automatically. So there's some code here. Um, I don't wanna go into the code line by line because we have more exciting things to look at um, later on, but this code is actually taken from, from the MongoDB blog. So if you look up um, automatically refreshing um, materialized views, you'll, you'll find the exact same code. But just to give you some idea of what we do here is we query the view we created from our, from our specified collection, create an array of all the merge commands, and then we just execute them. Again, simple stuff. Now, if assuming we've configured all of this correctly, this is what we should be seeing in Atlas. So if I go to triggers, logs, I should be able to see this trigger being executed every minute, ideally successfully with, a, with an okay status. And this shows that, yeah, we've been refreshing our um, materialized view successfully every single minute. Okay, so hopefully we can agree that now we've automated the process as well, right? So we're taking this one off. And one last remaining bit is the Java app. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it uh, because it's a Mongo conference, not a Java conference. But it's just a simple app which has some basic config. So we've got, so, so it allows us to enter the M and N values that we want. Um, it books trades and displays them in the GUI. Okay, so looks like we got all the items covered. So well done to all of us. And now let's look at the software. So I have a short video. I had to speed up the video a little bit because if you think about it, prices arriving every minute to see some kind of trades coming in through, it would take us a good few hours and I'm, I'm sure you don't wanna be stuck here for a few hours listening to me. So um, yeah, I had to speed up the video a little bit but hopefully you'll get the idea of how it all works. So this is my extremely sophisticated GUI. Um, bottom left is where we specify the M and N values. Um, at the top, we've, it's a chart, so we're gonna see our prices and our moving average curves intersecting with each other. And towards the bottom, we'll see trades coming in. And for each trade, hopefully they'll start arriving soon, for each trade, we'll see whether it was a buy or a sell, what price was used, um, and how much money we made. So yeah, we managed to build a very simple algorithmic trading application using a, a bunch of tools available to all MongoDB users. And now it's just doing its own thing, making money for us. By the way, this isn't investment advice by any way. Um, yeah, so towards the end, look at that. We made 35 cents profit. Very, <laughs> very impressive, yeah. <laughs> Cool, thank you very much on behalf of the software. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure that as amazed you are with the application, you're also, you can also tell that it's quite basic and that's fine because, oh sorry, let's go to the, let's go to the next slide. It's quite basic, but this was just a simple proof of concept, right? But hopefully looking at these different bits that we included in our, in our use case, you can, already think of some enhancements we might, we might make to the application to make it a bit more complex, a bit more useful. So I have a few examples here. So, you know, we only use two moving averages, but there's nothing stopping you from having multiple moving averages in parallel and seeing how changing the window affects your PNL, right? We also don't have to stick to just moving averages. There's plenty of functions available in the aggregation framework. 
So you can use other, other functions and see what kind of results you get, what kind of PNL you get. And finally, um, I use Java to, for example, store the trade data or PNL calculations. You can do that in Mongo as well. I mean, you should probably just um, upload trades as individual documents, use aggregation pipeline to calculate PNL. That's perfectly fine. So, um, yeah, there's plenty you can do with with what Mongo offers. All right. Um, Let's look at our key takeaways. So first of all, MongoDB time series is the smart way and the efficient way to store data like this. Um, and it also makes it way easier for any developer to work with financial data or any time series data. And if we combine it with materialized views, we can run some fairly complex analytics, way more complex than just moving averages. And Finally, um, using database triggers, we can make sure that our database, that our data remains fresh. We're not suffering from stale data. Whatever materialized views we use, um, they have the most recent version of, of the data. But the most important takeaway is next time you work with any time series data, use MongoDB. <laughs> All right, any questions? Do we have any questions? Okay, gentlemen at the back, and then you. So this POC that you've done, it's very interesting. Do you have it somewhere on GitHub, or it's not open source at the moment? Um, no, I don't have it on GitHub, but. Okay, do you have like a QR code or something? You no. can take a look? Okay. <laughs> not yet. I think there was someone in the middle here. All right, this gentleman. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks for a good, good demo. So in terms of the performance, when we query the time series collection, the data from time series collection, is there any, any benchmark or anything that you can sh shed some lights on? Like if I'm using a traditional collection versus a time series collection, is there any performance benefit? Yes, there is. And um, it was, I actually decided specifically to not discuss performance and so on because I believe my colleague Michael from the product team, he, he mentioned it yesterday, during a talk yesterday. And also, later today, there is a talk by another colleague of mine, Fuat. It starts very soon, and he'll go into this in more detail, and I believe he'll cover performance benefits as well. My talk was mainly just, I just wanted to focus on the use case, but yeah, there are performance benefits. <laughs> When you compare using the time series data, uh, sorry, time series collections to just regular collections, there's a huge, huge performance benefit. Uh, sorry, I was just a little confused. Your CSV file was a static file, right? Yeah. So why did you need this, the schedule job? It will, wouldn't it, will it just be, a, you just run it once, it would just analyze the last 10 minutes, five minutes, right? Well, I wanted to simul simulate a real world, world scenario. So. I basically had a Python script that goes through the CSV file line by line and pushes each, a price every minute into, my, into the database. Um, what's the resolution of our time series data can go down to like you know, sub-second, milliseconds? And part B of the question is, uh, are the triggers able to work at that speed? Well, so I'll, reply, I'll respond with the question, which I'm sure you'll love. Uh, what kind of performance you want to see? Um, it, we would have to look at every individual case and see what kind of data it is, what kind of calculations you want to perform, and, and then see how we can achieve that with, with Mongo. It should, but again, I, I didn't want to focus too much on performance during this talk. Um, We should be talking in sub-second, yeah. Yeah, and think about the algorithmistic trading, right? Oftentimes, you need to marry the data outside of, uh, let's say, MongoDB. Uh, how easy is it to, let's say, get like, the materialized data out of uh, MongoDB to marry with other data sources? What are some options for that? So you want to push data out of Mongo into another system? For, for like, yeah, for sub-second. And what, 
how do you want to do it? Is there any specific way? Like, maybe like if it's like a, a scheduled job, like maybe like um, a, a real time trigger, then maybe um, Kafka or like some sort of like event driven type of. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we. So it, it's supported, right? It's yeah, Kafka is absolutely supported. And the output and the output is also in the time series uh, uh, storage, right? Within. Uh, Mongo. I believe it should be fine. Yeah. Um, I, I see in your example, you just have one time series. What if uh, you have multiple time series, want to do some cross-sectional analysis, like more complex algo, so how would you do that? That is perfectly fine as well. You can, you can like I said, in my case, I only did, um, I only used prices for a single instrument or whatever it was, um, but yeah, you can upload multiple different time series um, collections, or actually within a single collection, you can have multiple different time series and run ag aggregations against them. Okay, you can run aggregation against each other or just look at relative. Yeah. I mean, I think rather than asking the question about whether it will perform for a true algorithmic trading system, I guess, do you know of any use cases out there where in the industry that they're actually using MongoDB for this type of activity? That is a good question, and I actually don't know any use cases on the top of my head. I can, that's something I can check. Yeah. And again, if you, if you stay for Fuad's talk, I'm, he might be able to help with that question. Hi, um, are all collection operations supported for time series collections, including aggregations, indexing? Yeah. So it's just like a regular collection, just has the time aspect to it? Yeah, and we're, ad we're adding more and more functionality to, um, to time series collections, but I guess most of the, the main, like, most of the bits of the of functionality are already covered with time series collections as well. Any other questions? Well, we've got time for one more if there is any. Otherwise, I will say, oh, one last one, there we go. Uh, materialized view, uh, do you have to update the whole view all the time or is it possible to just update based on new data that came? Um, if have to go back a few slides. When you create a materialized view, you specify what happen, what needs to happen when a record like that already exists in the, in the new database, sorry, in the new collection. Um, so you can either replace the old record or just ignore it. So I guess you, can just, you could just ignore it and that way it's only new data that would be processed and entered into the, into the new collection. Thank you. <laughs>